Tonight on Agendum, is the country sleepwalking into the path of a bright, out-of-control future? And even if it isn't, what does a question like that tell us about itself? I'm Alexandra Palisades. Good evening. It's been hailed as a technological breakthrough on a par with the internet. It's called Super Water and it's been selling like hot water, but has it claimed its first victim in the form of Ross Adler? News broke this morning that the Oscar-nominated Hollywood-based actor and supporting actor had died, apparently after drinking less than five millilitres of super water. It sent the makers into crisis management mode and their share value into a tailspin. So is it the revolutionary product that could rescue us from climate change? Or is it deadly? Anushka Babushka investigates. All that changes now. From today, things are different. Welcome to tomorrow. Welcome, Super Water! At its multimedia unboxing event 18 months ago, it sounded too good to be true. A product that could reverse drought, slow climate change, even miniaturise global shipping lanes. Super Water was called as significant as the God Particle, and the team who developed it awarded the Nobel Prize for novelty. But then... Tragedy struck. Breaking, celeb site TMZ is reporting that Ross Adler, star of Doofus Goldberg and Mustang Summer, has been found dead at his home in Beverly Hills. The 34-year-old actor is said to have drowned after drinking less than a teaspoon of super water. Friends of hot Rob Adler say he became addicted to the controversial liquid, sometimes taking as much as 10 to 15 drops a day. So what is super water? Super water, chemical symbol H squared 2 O, is the wettest substance known to man. William Withers is a lecturer in fluid dynamics. Uh, it's about 1,000 times wetter than water, and this obviously has its advantages. Just one thimble is enough to wash a whole bus, for example, but that extreme wetness, hyperliquidity as we call it, obviously presents problems too. So fish drown in super water. If you washed your hands with it, it would take about 15 days to get them dry. So it follows that you should never drink it unless it's been very heavily diluted. And even then, you'd be putting yourself at high risk of engaging in an end-of-life scenario. Shares in the makers of Superwater, Geobait, plummeted following today's news and in the words of the song, there's nothing like the bottom line to focus corporate minds. But with gallons of Superwater literally rolling off the production lines, there doesn't look to be any end in sight for the product. A product that has only just begun to start changing our lives. And in the last half hour, Geobait has issued a statement, but it's embargoed until midnight, so all I can do is flap it at you. Joining me to discuss Superwater are Violet Red Party from the Green Party and Anthony Helzebub from the think tank Profitos. Violet, if I may come to you first. No, you can't. Anthony Helzebub, Superwater, vital or lethal? Well, the simple answer is clearly vital, isn't it? It's a wonderfully innovative product. It's the sort of thing that big technology needs in this country. It's going gonna, it's gonna to provide jobs, it's going to provide great wealth, and it's the first new water since the invention of distilled water, which was uh, a thousand years ago. Violet Red Party, is this a case of closing the horse after the door has galloped? Absolutely, Alexandra. I mean, uh, you know, this this stuff is lethal. This is Franken water. Uh, no, uh, Basically, no, again, it's no, 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 no. I'm sorry, could I finish? No, it is. It is called super water. It's got Franken water is the name of the inventor. Julius Franken is a perfectly respectable chemist, and <laughs> you know, so to corporate <laughs> mouth. Is, <laughs> it's a fair point, though, and I think it's worth mm. pursuing. Well, is this something that can solve many of the world's problems? No, no. It sounds it sounds like it could, but as some, but as with so many can, things that sound good, it's bad. It that? could turn, you know, landlocked areas into effective seaside without warning. Is uh, is somewhere like Birmingham ready for that? Well, is, what, is Birmingham ready for anything? But I mean, it, it no, is ready. But that is a reasonable point. Well, that is. But, I, but, but I think, but if I was, if I was a resident of Birmingham, and praise the Lord, I am not. But if I woke up one morning well, and someone said, that. "You have a seaside here. You have a the, the, there's donkeys, there's piers." I mean, I'm extrapolating slightly. Those would come later in the process. But if someone were to say there is seaside out your front door, I'd be delighted. Bring it on, I would say. Well, Leaving no landlocked around. areas aside for a moment. Violet Red Party, I can see you object very strongly I do. to Superwater. Do, do you have more specific grounds on which to do I so? I just think we need to think of all the uh, ordinary people that it's going to affect. For example, homeopaths. If a homeopathic practitioner uh, accidentally dilutes an ingredient in Superwater rather than regular water, it will make a nonsense of the whole idea of homeopathy. This is a fair point, and it not only 
would it affect homeopaths? Let's move on to psychopaths. Mm. What about the bioterrorism implications? Yep. It's said that one glass of super water could kill many dozens of, for example, people. Mm. Correct. We should be treating it like nuclear waste, oh. disposing of it in secure no, no, uh, huge, drums. Huge, I mean, I think you're really overwhinding the situation. A, a simple glass of, of um, Ebola could kill many dozens of people, but people, people aren't sort of concerning themselves over that. People and, and really what... are rather concerning themselves about that, but if we could stick to super yeah, water. But, yeah, but super, you say you want to dispose of it in a safe fashion with the safest fashion is you just dilute it with, with regular, with, with heritage water and, and you've got water. I mean, how, well, how that's difficult a waste of water. It is. Well, it's not a waste of water, is it? Because you need less water. Well, not, not all of us can afford Tradi heritage water, well, Anthony. Anthony, Anthony, you need less Anthony water. Anthony well, have you tried super water? I have certainly uh, been uh, in the presence of it many times and that's seen it drunk. That's not what I asked. Mm. Have you tried super water? Tried as in... Tried. Well, tried. Tried it as a... Um, have you tried... Super water. You'll have to be more specific. I, 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 I I've tried I've tried it. Have you drunk it? In that case, in that case I will be more specific. Right. Anthony Helzebub, have you tried super water? Uh, uh, yes, I, uh, I have uh, enjoyed the presence of super water <clears throat> in my mouth. Finally, Violet Red Party. Will super water revolutionise washing machines? No, they go round already. Anthony Helzebub, Violet Red Party, thank you. You may not even have noticed, but Britain is undergoing an urban revolution. You only have to think of the new private city of Weatherspoon in Lincolnshire, attracting customer citizens with an urban loyalty card scheme and two-for-one offers on police protection. Or Dundee's electrified wall to keep out anyone who can't describe their job in fewer than three words. But the biggest change to Britain's built-up areas over the last year has been the annexation of parts of Derbyshire by the TV presenter and former Radio 1 DJ, Noel Edmonds. Here's Martin McChronicle with a report on the progress of the Shock Midlands coup. You probably won't be able to recognise this road from the sound, unless you're a very niche circus act, but I'm standing on the A6 between Buxton and Derby. And should you want to visit those historic places, you'll have to find another route, because between them is Matlock Bath, and Matlock Bath belongs to Noel Edmonds. The tourist town was taken six days ago by Edmund's militia. His followers, numbering 1,100, carrying Chinese-made assault rifles, met little resistance. The town is the sixth to fall to the Deal or No Deal host since September last year. Edmund's private army have established their own laws, town parliaments and currency, the Nola. They have instituted what they call common sense law at gunpoint. Hair is to be no longer than collar length and no shorter than collar length. Beards are compulsory for men, women, children and livestock. 68-year-old Edmonds, who turned up unannounced in South Derbyshire last year in a pink and yellow spotted Challenger tank, has been gathering strong support from the people of the region, who seem happy to welcome their new leader. You know, well, you could have a pint with him. Well, maybe I have. Videos taken by supporters on camera phones show Edmund speaking to rallies from a requisitioned cherry picker. Please be warned that these videos may distress some listeners as they are filmed in portrait mode. The illegitimate government of the so-called United Kingdom will fall. Blah, 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 blah. Are we going to have a society that is fair and deals? Yes. You a legend. In a video released on his own website, Noel Edmonds insisted his takeover was a victory for good old-fashioned common sense. For the upper state, O'Leary, he will be But nobody goes in, nobody comes out. A news blackout means facts are thin on the ground and speculation is running nuts. The tabloids, a sort of paper news of a particular size, have dubbed the group Noel Qaeda, and a Twitter account of that name already has over a million followers despite not being officially recognised by the late, late breakfast show star, who is communicating with the outside world only by fax. As always with Edmonds, we can only watch and wait in horror. 
With me to discuss the fall of Derbyshire to Noel Edmonds is Daily Telegraph columnist Melanda Brubeck. Good. And the political analyst Gordian Bridgman, whose latest book, Against Humans, is currently occupying several illegal settlements on the Amazon bestseller list. No thanks, I'm pescatarian. So, Noel Edmonds' invasion of Derbyshire. Is this a good thing, a bad thing, or a third, different sort of thing? I'm just going to come in straight. Um, so, why shouldn't he? Why shouldn't Noel Edmonds be in charge? He's very popular. Uh, a house party, peak viewing figures of 15 million. Blobby single, certified platinum. You know, this is in every sense of the word, the will of the people in action. Surely we can't just let Noel Edmonds take over wherever he likes, Melanda? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't believe we're even discussing this. Um, even when the whole of the mainstream media, the mainstream so-called media, are refusing to talk about Vernon K. Island. If I, if I, if I can just butt in there, I, I think that's a very different issue because K, he's a far more divisive figure. Well, yeah. I think we can <laughs> allow Milan to finish. His ambition has been allowed to run completely unchecked. I mean, Vernon, and I know about this because I'm friendly with Tess, took over Brown Sea Island in Pool Harbour three years ago. And there have been no protests, no coverage from the mainstream media at all. Nobody knows what the hell's going on in there. If we can leave Vernon Kay to one side, surely letting Noel Edmonds take over areas of the country willy-nilly makes a mockery of democracy. He's a popular guy, you know? Uh, th you know, 3,000 episodes of Deal or No Deal. I, I haven't seen every one, but I've, I've seen a hefty majority and I haven't seen... Um, you know, I think, Tony I think, Blair doing anything like that. <laughs> I mean, I think I think Gordian's point is interesting there, Alexandra, because I think it's Camus that said that uh, democracy is simply the form of government invented by people who don't know that they know everything or, or who know that they don't know I everything. Agree with it's, that. it's yes, it's something like that. I mean, we're now seeing the fruits of that coming to bear, and the fruits of that to are. Bear. Television well, the, celebrities these, annexing these, parts these, of the country. Well, if he's the right man for the job. Right? No, yeah. no, I don't know why we're discussing it. I, how, I, how, how exactly I is he the right the man now. for the job? Sorry? How exactly is he the right man for the job? OK. Um, to clarify. He's a rich man. So that means that means he doesn't have to appeal to people. So so unlike, an M, unlike a member of parliament... <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's not going to be claiming any duck houses. We may be getting ever so slightly off the point. To return to Noel Edmonds, he has claimed he has a mandate for his rule, but he's also threatened public violence if anyone opposes him, calling his opponents heretics and tarantists. I think you've taken his comments out of their context because he was saying that the tarantists... You know, it, it's less that you, you are in support of Chris Tarrant and more you've got the, the Chris Tarrant mindset. And I, I completely agree with him on that because I can't stand the man. I but think either there's... way, either way, Tarrantist is it's a, slur. a foul slur. It's a slur, sure. But, uh, you know, uh, what else are you going to call him? What else do you call someone who, who blindly follows in, in the doctrine of Chris Tarrant? Christian. But... That's already taken, uh, That it? is taken. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, why? Because that's where it belongs. Gentlemen, thank you. Love it or hate it, health is everywhere. We're all aware of the importance of eating five a day and the biggest selling health gadget last year was the fruit bit, the digital wristband that painfully constricts your blood flow if you don't buy enough grapes. But a new survey about Britain's fruit preferences has, if you'll pardon the fruit cliché, really put the cat amongst the apple carts, as Nokia Rington reports. We all love oranges. They're an attractive shape and come in an easy-to-remember colour. But if you love oranges, you're in for a shock because a new survey has found out that you don't. Our data reveals that oranges have an approval rating of close to zero. Nobody likes them, even if they say they do. Stephen St Kitchen is the senior analyst at Salerno Findings, who were commissioned to commission the survey by a consortium of fruiterers. And to put that in context, that is 60% below bananas and on a level with non-food items such as cat hair and magnets. If you enjoyed an orange with your breakfast, or maybe as the well-behaved part of a meal deal, you may be shocked to discover that you didn't. It's time to face facts. Oranges are unreliable and fiddly. Their segments are festooned with a revolting rubbery string and they're only eaten out of a grim sense of duty. Some say the orange industry knew this was coming. Satsuma, Mandarin, Tangerine, Easy Peeler, rebrand after rebrand. And last Christmas, a £30 million advertising campaign to get oranges back in stockings with yet another new name. Hang on. 
What are you doing in my bedroom? You're not Father Christmas. No, we're the hot house flowers. And your stocking just got fruit festive, thanks to these new sun fresh, easy zip mouth globes. Here in New Covent Garden, the hub of London's fruit trade, they say they sell an orange every 15 seconds, and that's faster than a cheetah. I see you've got a lot of oranges here. Do you normally have so many? Nah, it's in the nose, wasn't it? About oranges. Can't shift the bloody things. What are you going to do with them? I don't know, probably put them in the sea or well. I normally take them home or eat them myself, but not now. Nah, not now. And the public seem wary too. Do you like oranges? Oh, no, no, cancer. Cancer? Yeah, I saw it on Philip Schofield, I think. I said they're worse than um, plutonium. You know, you've got to think of your health, haven't you? The link between oranges and cancer is at the moment still unclear, but that is scant comfort to the nation's orange eaters, sadly unwrapping these miserable balls of pith out of guilt and habit. The message is clear. Oranges may not be the only fruit, but they are by far the worst. With me to discuss the deepening orange crisis is Keith Happyhausen of Apple Inc., not the computer firm, the Fruiterous Trade magazine. Thank you very much for having me. And celebrity greengrocer June Orbit. Have a potato. Thank you. Keith, you first published this report. Were you surprised by the findings? We were surprised, as were the people who commissioned the report at the British Apple Board. June, why do you think mm. nobody likes oranges? Well, forgive me, but I don't think that's the story. Is it not? No, it's a, this is a smokescreen. Um, what we should be talking about is the link between oranges and cancer. Oranges okay, and cancer? Yeah, uh, you must have been following the story. I, I've just been checking my Twitter. Sorry, and, but when were you checking Twitter? Just now, while the, the man was talking. Um, right. I've been checking Twitter and a BBC reporter recently made a link between oranges and the disease cancer, and the internet has lit up like a light. Interesting. This isn't relevant, is it? I mean, any cancer risk from oranges, if there was one, would be offset by the fact that nobody likes them. OK, could I finish? Um, orange cancer is trending. Uh, if you've not seen the memes, then I don't know where you've been. I mean, how long have you fruit fat cats been hiding this cancer risk from us? Keith hmm? Happyhausen, what do you have to say about this link between what oranges and cancer? Say? I'd like to know. Got nothing to say about this link, it doesn't exist. <laughs> this kind of refusal to engage with the uh, year's biggest health story is just going to worry people further. This is absolute madness. It, what do you mean? It's it's madness. It's on the internet, so it's not madness, is it? You know, it's a bit far-fetched to say it's madness. People so, don't talk about nonsense on the internet. Let's move on to that point. It's a reasonable point. Keith, why is it, then, <clears throat> that people don't like oranges? People don't like oranges for lots of reasons. Cancer. For example, nothing rhymes with orange. Nobody ever wrote a song about an orange. It's a good point. June, do you know any songs with fruit in? No, this is typical of the BBC to cover up a story like this. The Grapefruit Song by the Beatles. Pineapple Alley by, by the Beatles. I want to give you a plum by the Beatles. You're shutting the door after the orange has bolted. This cancer story is not going to go away, however many songs you name. I think people are perfectly able to make up their own minds without being told what to think. It's irresponsible. This is clearly an argument that's going to run and run, but not here. Oh. Raspberry Fields Forever by The Beatles. Thank you both. Now, what price the phone in your pockets? Well, that depends on whether you buy it or have it on a monthly payment plan. But what human price the phone's in your pocket? Disturbing footage from a factory in the Chinese province of Guangzhou shows an uncomfortable truth about the phone in your pocket that a vital part of the manufacturing process involves harvesting the tears of children children as young as four. Norma Sternip has this report. <laughs> Their tears are real. Children as young as four being made to cry, and all so you can go on Twitter on the train. Andrew McBoatface works for Children's Rights Watch. The polarising poly put the ketaline layer in the display of most smartphones is thought to operate more efficiently if it's coated with a thin film of children's tears. The tears mean that black is true black, which could extend battery life, so the factories hire children, make them cry and harvest the results. McBoatface classifies this as a human rights violation, but the factory owners say the children are a vital part of the manufacturing process. We have to use the children's tears because adults are too sentimental. They cry at anything, films, sport, princesses. They are not truly upset. They are just wistful for their vanishing youth. And they say their methods are harmless too. To help the children make tears that are pure, we tell them their parents are dead. 
But this is okay, because we tell them their parents hated them. In footage smuggled out of the factory and shot on a phone probably made there in impressive high definition, another busload of children from preparatory school 30 are shipped in to be upset. The children are paid one dollar per week, so they are eventually very content after they have stopped crying. And to some children, the damage is more than emotional. On occasion, a child will cry itself dry. But then we rehydrate the junior worker using the machine from Batman. They are then returned to health and returned to crying duty. It's not what the phone companies would like you to see. But this is the young, tear-stained face of an everyday technology we use every day. And as long as we upgrade to the latest handset, the children of Huangzhou will continue weeping their eyes out on an industrial scale. That distressing report. And if you visit our website, there is a form you can fill in and an address. There is almost certainly also an online petition and a little flag you can put on your profile picture, which will probably help. The world of entertainment was rocked this week by the death of the film and television actor Frank Harness, following a long battle with cancer. The star sign, not the illness. Disco McCrami takes a look back at the great man's career. Walk through Elstree Studios today and you can taste sadness in the stardust. An icon has ceased. Frank Harness was a comedian, an actor, an artist, a playwright, a Rotarian and an asthmatic. But despite his long list of screen credits, he will almost certainly be best remembered as Oggo, the Spice Bear, from the 1980 science fantasy film, Cunts. Argus Pyrillian is mustering his skeletalites at the gazebo of Patavel. But the jump hole of Patavel leads straight to the podlings of Dalarax. Well, what are we waiting for? I have defretted your beam caster, sir. Thanks, Argo. Looks like I'm gonna need it. Though his character only had one line and was vaporised immediately, fans loved Ogo, and the furry bear toting his beamcaster became a staple convention costume and subject of fan art. When astronaut Tim Peake opened the new A13 toll road from space, fans were thrilled to see he was wearing an Ogo t-shirt. Harness's 24 frames of screen time had become a cult he could never have predicted. Harness was born in Harrogate in the usual way and moved to London in the 1960s to study drama at the same time. He had small comic parts but refused to let the condition hold him back and was soon making memorable but brief appearances in low-budget British comedies such as The Crumpeteer. Hmm, check out the Amazon that. Hold me bucket, Stan, I'm going in. But Ted, Ted... Ted, don't leave me up here! Whoa, whoa, whoa! I have polished your bucket, sir. Harness struggled for work in the 1970s, appearing in two episodes of Policemen, and as Guffy, the man who hands Michael Caine a towel in the film Hectic Wallops. But it was a chance audition for Wonderkint director Tab Curtains in 1978 that would land Harness the role that would make him immortal and haunt him forever. I mean, one doesn't wish to sound ungrateful, but you can't help feeling trapped. I went from being an actor with a wide range of varied roles to someone who simply handed things over while dressed as a bear. And if you're typecast like that, well, the parts just aren't there. Mm -hmm. But you are popular, aren't you? You sign a lot of autograph books. I enjoy the conventions, and the fans are awfully nice, if a bit musty about the Oxters at times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I never realised quite how success might limit one. Mm -hmm. Harness didn't appear in the recent multi-million dollar reboot of the Kumpf franchise, but his character did, reborn in CGI and voiced by Benedict Cumberbatch. In Oggo the Spice Bear, Harness had created a character that was so memorable, so immortal, it didn't even need him. I have defretted your beam caster, sir.
I'm joined by Kareem Folgate of pop cult app zine, The Octagon. Cheers. What did Frank Harness mean to you? You have to understand what it was like for people from my generation. Like, this film changed everything. And, it, and it's the greatest film ever. And Ogo is, is right at the heart of that. Mm. Now, surely anyone could have played the character. It, it was, after all, a man in a bear suit no, saying um, six words. That, that, that's, that's a popular misconception. There's, there's actually a truth in, in his eyes that, that it reaches out of the bear suit and, and it holds your hand and, and it's just there and it's real and I love it. Like, can, can, can you see that? Oh, yes. Like, look at that. Mm. Like, how does that make you feel? Not great. Because I, I, I was going to get it done on my groin, but, like, I needed room for, for like, the ears. What, um, sorry, what is it, so sooty or... No, <laughs> fuzzy, no. <laughs> it, it's Ogo. William Elso, oh, right. It's Ogo. Right. Because I love him. Great. <laughs> yeah, he changed my life, like, he changed He changed everything. He, he was like my David Bowie. Did you not like David Bowie? Not after I saw Ogo. Like, like who else is going to be taken from this? Do you know what I mean? Like... Everyone who made life worth living is slowly being taken away. And I don't think that's by the government. I think that's just people dying. But I can't get past this idea that there are all these films we're not going to have, all this music. Music? I wasn't aware that he made any music. When I saw that he died, I cried. Right. And I cried and I cried and yep. I cried mm -hmm. and I cried and right. I cried. Mm. And I cried, and I cried. Did you? You saw him and you thought, things can't be the same again. You saw him and you thought, I can be me, you know? Like, I can express myself. Like, I can tell my dad I'm gay. Uh, I can set fire to a bus shelter. I, mm -hmm. I can strangle a horse if I want. I, I'm going to be me. Yeah. Oh, go! Right, now, uh, would you please get off the desk? Yeah. OK. Now, to a new generation of fans, their Oggo will be a very different character, a computer-generated hipster mm. character with a completely different voice. And that's a travesty, and and it's akin to the fall of Rome, because they're important works of art, and, and the death of Frank Harness is so important. Like, I don't know anyone who's not been affected by this. Like, me, my brother, everyone on my timeline. That's everyone! And this is the saddest anyone's ever been about anything and will ever be. Are you absolutely sure about that? I could not be surer. I think we as a culture are unlikely to recover. Mm, and a final thought? Ab about the... Out loud, right, if, if um, possible. I'll be surprised if there are any films ever made again. Full stop. Well, at the end of that round, Kareem Folgate, you have scored. Thank you. Great. Just time for a quick listen to the big words on the front of tomorrow's papers. The Guardian leads with ninth beetle named by Home Office. The Times unmasks the woman behind the world exclamation mark shortage. And the Daily Express has now BBC gives Del Boy's yellow van own chat show. That's all from Agendum tonight, but Captain will be back here same time tomorrow. He's my Irish setter. From all of me here, good night.